Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Um, let us begin with a few announcements. They'll be up on the screen. Uh, so first of all, our senior ministry is this Tuesday, uh, March 5th at 11 a.m. You are welcome to be here at 11. Um, they have like a little time of social time and, and conversation, and, uh, and so it's a lot of fun. Our Open Door Bistro is this Wednesday, uh, March 6th. It is corned beef and cabbage. We're celebrating St. Patrick's Day early, so come on 5.30 for corned beef and cabbage. And then after at 6 is the continuation of our, our all-church-wide, our Lenten study on Peter, um, on finding, finding faith with Peter. And so we just had an amazing time. We have our net out there because we're talking about Peter. And so last week we talked about all the fish that Peter caught. So we all made fish. And so as you leave today, look at all the fish. And what we wrote on it was what we feel called to. So look at those. This week we are journeying with Peter out of the boat to walk on water. So, and we're going to do a really super creative way of experiencing the scripture. So it is for all ages. It's intergenerational, 6 o'clock um, this Wednesday, and uh, supper at 5.30. And then next week on the 13th, there'll also be supper at 5.30, and then our, our uh, time together at 6 o'clock. Uh, the Women's for Discipleship, remember our Women's Bible Study continues this Tuesday. Um, Fly High, our other small group, continues on Friday at noon. And prayer breakfast, if you've never been to prayer breakfast, wonderful way to start your month. 7 a.m. this Thursday in Thomas Coke, um, we share a simple meal, uh, devotion, and then we share a communion together. Church camp is coming up for all those ages 8 to 17, July 21st to 26th. You can register on our website. Um, scholarships are available. Um, so come join our church camp. Come invite your kids and grandkids and nephews and nieces and neighbors to come join you with that. Our children and our youth discipleship, remember our chapel time each Sunday, our youth group, the first and third. So our youth group will be this Wednesday, the first Wednesday of the month. So for junior and senior high, our youth group will be meeting this Wednesday. They'll be part of the Lenten experience, and then they'll um, have some time to meet afterwards as well. And then if you want to help out with children and youth, come talk with me or Laura, of course. Um, just a few other things in your bulletin. You have the Easter lilies. Looks like this. Um, as we get ready for Easter, all you got to do is just fill that out and uh, put in memory of and honor of your name. These are due by March 17th. The cost is $12. Just put any uh, check or anything in the, in the plate that is, that is there with you. Um, in your insert, you have uh, a thing that says refugee family needs. We have quite a few refugees that are here. We have more that are on the way. And our resource room, which is used a lot here in this church, we, there's a lot of families that depend on this church. Our resource room is in the discovery zone at the end of the hall, if you've never seen it. And um, it, we're running low on some things. So here's a list of things we could really, really, we really need. So all you got to do is just get them, bring them down to the room, or put them on the rack that's at the beginning of the hallway here. And that would be great. Um, for the month of March, for Loose Coin, we are going to be focusing on Umcore. Specifically, we call it Umcore Sunday, but our Umcore Sunday will be each Sunday of March. And so there's a really cool uh, slideshow running in the gathering area. I invite you to watch that. But here's just a little more information. Last year, you, meaning you as in the United Methodist Church Worldwide, gave $1.5 million to UMCOR Sunday, which is the United Methodist Council on Relief. And your generosity underwrote UMCOR's administrative costs so that the funds for humanitarian relief go directly to the communities in need here and around the world. So... Please uh, know that any loose, uh, loose change, loose money <laughs> um, will go to support um, UMCOR, the administrative costs. And if you want more info, while you're looking at the fish, turn around and look at the screen and then go into fellowship time. We've got lots for you to do after church, all right? Look at fish, look at the screen, head into fellowship time. Um, so I think that is it for my announcement. I want to welcome those that are online. I invite you to use the comment section to say good morning to one another. If you haven't, if you're in the sanctuary, turn to someone near you, behind you, in front of you, kitty corner, across the sanctuary, wave to them, give a smile, say good morning. Let's come ready to hear and be inspired, be transformed as we let the Holy Spirit break forth into our hearts and lives as we come and as we worship. 
Our liturgist for this morning is Lee. You can remain seated, but I wanna, uh, we will begin with our responsive call to worship. So, Lee, thank you for being our liturgist this morning. On these days of Lenten journey, at every bend in the river, at every fo fork in the road, every day, each path we wander, each road we travel, we never journey alone. I'll go back and catch the part I skipped there. <laughs> At every surprising turn and in every corkscrew twist. Jesus, Thank you. Our scripture lesson this morning is from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17, 
That's page 66 in your pew Bible. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of, of, of your Lord, of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female servant or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor.
Our uh, gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 2. Hear these words. The Passover was near and Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. May God add a blessing to our hearing and our living out the word this day. It is our uh, young disciples time, but here's the note I was asked to read. Young disciples uh, is next, but remain in your seats. Hold your seats uh, while Mr. Steve and Mr. D complete a brief setup for you. So don't come up yet. Don't come up yet. <laughs> no, not, not yet. Okay, Mr. G. Mr. D, I will have you perhaps set up, whoops, right over here. Yes, I'm going to be here. That looks pretty good. All right, so any children who are interested in being part of the Young Disciples time, please line up here in front of my office. <laughs> and Mr. D, let us prepare ourselves for this. We are all about business here. Let's see if I can possibly get this on. There, all right, now we're ready to go. Yep, just form a line wherever. That's very good. Okay. So. First of all, uh, I am Mr. Steve, and this is my associate, Mr. D. Welcome to Young Disciples Time. I'm pleased to announce that the price for a ticket for admittance is only 25 cents today. So, here we are. I think very reasonable. We have high quality standards we're trying to maintain. All right. So, did everybody bring money with them today? <laughs> All right, I was not expecting the yes answers here. Okay, so yes, we could accept credit, debit, Apple Pay, whatever you want. Okay. Fortunately, for anyone who didn't bring any money with them, S and D L L C. Uh, we have generous credit terms at a very reasonable APR. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Almost nobody does. Uh, so, now each of you has 25 imaginary cents, either in your pocket or your sock or your shoe. I want you to find your 25 imaginary cents and hold it up so I can see it. <laughs> they are imaginary. This is not, yeah. <laughs> We're still looking. <laughs> All right, it's in your boot. <laughs> it's in your shoe. It's in your pocket. Hold up your hands. Pretend you have money in there. All right, that's all we really needed here. All right. Ah, okay. So, uh, this is a two-step process. Uh, Mr. D, you can get the stuff out of your bag there and uh, do your setup. Mm -hmm. Yep, right out of the bag and so forth. So, 
Each of you will give me your 25 imaginary cents, put it on the table. I will give you a ticket. Take the ticket over to Mr. D, who will stamp your hand with what I believe to be washable ink. <laughs> Almost sure it's washable ink. It is. It, it really is. It is. It is. Okay. You need that because not only does this ticket get you into the young disciples' time, but it also provides entry to chapel time with Laura after this, so you have to have your hand stamped. As I've practiced on my hand, some of these turn out imperfectly, but as long as you have a little bit of ink on there, you're all set to go. Right now, uh, I'll give you your ticket, bring it to Mr. D, Mr. D will stamp your hand, and then you can have a seat here, because we need to talk about this just a little bit, in case you think this is kind of a strange way of doing things. Okay, if you'll stand, please, and... Come for it, put your uh, imaginary money on the table. There's your ticket. Go right over there to Mr. D. Next customer, there you are. Okay. Imaginary money, excellent. Ticket. Who's next? There you are. Thank you very much. Oh, now don't go back to your seats. Go and sit in the front there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We've lost one. Okay. Here's $25 million. <laughs> I've been given a large tip here of $25 million because someone truly values. Do you have your ticket? Oh, your hand is stamped. Excellent. Okay. Sit up there because I'm going to sit on the steps next. I'm going to move to a different spot. So... Luna, come on this way, if you want to sit up here. Okay. Whoa. So what did you think? Is this the way we should do things at church? They accept no. <laughs> well, the tip part was good, but, you know, when you come to church, do you expect somebody to say, you have to pay 25 cents? To, or $25 million or $25 or anything. Yeah. So if you heard, Pastor Tim was telling us about a time Jesus went to the temple, which would have been the church where he lived. And do you know what he found outside? Money. He found people, yeah, like busy with money. It was more like going to a grocery store or something like that. There were animals around. There were people changing money. All sorts of this different kinds of business going on. And nobody was paying attention to what's really important at church. So I'll ask you, what is really important at church? Faith, Faith yep. Hope. Hope. And what kind of things do we do at church that are kind of special, special for church, that you wouldn't necessarily do in some other places? Praying. Praying. Worshiping, yeah. Jesus was just letting everyone know what's important. Yep, he kind of shut down the whole business enterprise going on, and people could focus on what was really important. So, if you will join me for a prayer, and we'll do the echo prayer. Dear God, Thank you for the wonderful place to pray. It is a place where no tickets are needed and all are welcome. For that we give you thanks. And all God's children said, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steve, Mr. D. <laughs>
And everybody head back to chapel time. (laughs) Thank you that everything is free. (laughs) Like God's grace. We'll let Deli finish up there. (laughs) So when I was was growing up, I grew up in a a small little town. I went to a a small little school where I started. Um, I can remember how the uh, teacher in my classroom would explain kind of the rules of the classroom when you would start. They would be printed on the, on the wall. And uh, the way it worked was this. You had the rules. You knew what they were. You went over them. If you broke a rule, then you had your name written on the chalkboard. So then if you broke another rule, then you got a check mark next to your name. Um, and that meant that a letter went home. And then if you did another rule, so now you've had like three, you've broken three rules in the same school day, you got a second check mark, which means your parents had to come in and talk to the teacher uh, themselves. So one check mark was pretty bad. Two resulted in a consequence that nobody really wanted to face, right? And, And if you didn't get any names on the chalkboard, everybody in the whole class got a huge reward. So that's how things were. And the message was pretty clear to us, right, why this was going on. This is how we were going to live and learn as a classroom. This is how we were going to be. This is what was going to guide us and shape us, and this is how we were going to be together as a community, as a classroom, uh, as, we, as we moved through the school year. Well, when the Israelites are delivered um, from captivity and slavery in Egypt, where they had been slaves for 400 years, they had no idea how to live together as free people. They had no concept of freedom, no concept of how to be as a community. So in this time, they are brought to the base of Mount Sinai. Moses goes up. He comes down with a, with a uh, not with a chart of rules and check marks, right? He comes down with 10 very powerful life-giving statements engraved in stone of how they are to come together Um, how they are to live together as a community of free people. More than that, um, these statements which came to be known as the Ten Commandments were a promise. They were a promise from God to the people that they would never be abandoned, that God was with them. Um, God didn't just deliver them and let them go, but God was going to stay with them to form them into a community, to form them and shape them. So in this season of Lent, we are, as a community, focusing on on the promises that are given to us in this time. How do we claim those promises that guide and shape us in the way we are to live and love together? And so we're going to look at these these commandments today, and we look at the first one, which is really a statement of grace. God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. And before Israel is asked to do anything, God reminds them of everything that was done on their behalf and reminds them of whose they are. And then the rest of them kind of flow from this one. And the Ten Commandments are organized in, in a very, uh, very distinctive way. It's not haphazard. So the first four deal with the relationship between God and God's people, right? And the last six deal with the relationship between the people themselves. So in our relationship with God, we are called next to not worship idols. And idols are anything or anyone we worship by giving our time, our attention, or our affection. So it's not a little statue, right? An idol is anything that draws our time, that draws our attention, that, that gets all of us, Right? Anything that pulls us away from that path of life and love and hope and grace we're called to walk becomes an idol. It becomes a distraction. We're not to use the name of God. We're not to use God's name as a position of judgment. We're not to use it to judge others. We're not to use it to make ourselves feel superior to others. And we're not supposed to use the name of of God so irreverently um, that it just becomes irrelevant, right? So we don't want to, we want to be careful in how we use God's name. The fourth commandment in this relationship with God was probably the most important. It was about that you needed to spend time with God. You needed to be in a relationship. So this is called Sabbath. This was um, designated a very specific time in the week. It was Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. That is the Sabbath. It's a time to stop. You stop working. You, You take time to focus on God. On, on 
on the promises of God. You take this time to think about your neighbors more deeply. You take this time to, to turn your whole heart, your whole life towards God. And then from here, we turn to those promises of God that are helping and guiding us in our relationship with each other. Um, because when you put God first, which is why you have the first four, right? When you put God first, then that affects all our other relationships in our lives. And so next, we're called to honor our fathers and mothers. We are to treat them with respect and obedience. And this is the only commandment of the ten that comes with a promise. And it says, if you do this, um, that you do this so that things will go well for you and you will live a long time in the land. So here's the point of this commandment. The way we treat our parents is a model for how we would like our children to treat us, right? To care for us. More than that, what it says to us is our young people, whether they're our children or our neighbor's kids or our nephews and nieces or whoever it is, they are watching us. And the way that we treat the elderly the way that we treat the disabled, the way that we treat the weakest members of society models for our children how you want them to act. And it affects how they will then treat us. Our next one says very simply, do not murder. All life belongs to God. All life is sacred. We are not to act out of hate, out of vengeance, and we are not to deliberately take a life. Then we're told don't commit adultery. This is, given, this is given to keep us from hurting ourselves and others by pursuing what is emotionally and spiritually damaging to us as we break our vows and, and destroy trust in relationships. And then we're told, do not steal. And this is about the integrity that we need to have, right? And there should never be a price where we're willing to give that up. Then do not bear false witness against your neighbor. We're call to think and reflect on the words that we speak and what we pass on to others. And then we end with the tenth one, you shall not covet. And it gives a whole long list of things that you're not supposed to want or desire or want to obtain, right? And in a sense, the tenth one goes right back to the first one. We're meant to ask, what and who do we treat as God? Where do we find meaning and purpose? In the things of this world or the things of heaven? So you don't covet. You don't desire or, or have in your heart that you want all these other things, right? Because our focus isn't on the things of the earth. It's on the things of heaven. And so we have, and that was a very brief synopsis, I get it. Go home and read those Ten Commandments. Um, we have these words of promise and life and grace that are given to us as a gift, Really? They're, they're a gift of how we're to act and kind of be in the world. The problem is the message doesn't always get across. So the danger is that over time, we can begin to see them as nothing more than a list of harsh rules. Rather than viewing them as they're intended, these were given as a gracious gift to the people that would describe and define for them what it meant to live as free people not as some authoritarian blackboard writing checking system, right? So to put this in perspective, I want to share with you these words from the Reverend Charles Cook. He was a chaplain in the United States Army. He uh, served in Vietnam. And so he writes this about how he arrived in Vietnam. These were his words. He says, arriving on a Bo Boeing 707 in Vietnam, I noticed what looked like a beautiful, gorgeous soccer field all around the compound where we were to land. The flattest, greenest, most desirable fields you ever saw. But these inviting fields were killing fields. They were minefields. I remember one afternoon, not long after arriving, that a group of kids had snuck through the fence and were playing stickball right in the middle of the minefield. The MPs who were supposed to be watching went colorless. They quickly found the map of where the mines were located and made a very careful, deliberate route to get the kids grabbing the kids who did not understand what they were saying. They were writhing and screaming in terror. I could only wonder at how, at how frightened these children were and their mothers who were now gesticulating in helpless anguish, neither side able to understand one another. The mothers trying to run to their children but are being held back by the MPs so they don't run into the minefield. These mothers, I'm sure, believed that their children were going to be killed when actually the opposite was happening. They could not realize that the MP's prohibition was infinitely more merciful 
than thoughtless permission would have been. So that night as I lay in my cot, I wondered what would have happened if in the name of shallow and indulgent love, the company commander had listened to the cries of those children. I tried to imagine him saying, oh, I'm sorry. We really don't want to inconvenience you. Go ahead and finish your game of stickball. We are sorry that we got in the way. As I lay awake on my cot, listening to the explosions in the far off distance, I cried myself to sleep because of where I was, because I lived in a world where minefields even had to exist and be used. And then I realized there are minefields all over the place. The drugs that entice our kids, poverty afflicting too many, the violence of our world, the apathy of so many. On and on, minds of jealousy, of hatred, of racism, of injustice. And the image I had that night as I drifted off was of Jesus holding the map yelling and pointing and carrying people out of the minefield to give them life. I could not help wondering if the God of the Ten Commandments is less interested in spoiling his children's fun than in telling them that they are in a minefield. So as we reflect on those words by Reverend Cook, perhaps we should recognize that God's way is not imposed from above, at least it should not be, but is rather from within. We need to let go. We need to let God guide and transform and shape our hearts as we find a new way to be as new creations in Christ. We are horrified and should be horrified that we see images and hear of incidents of violence, of abuse, of hatred. And we know there will always be people who choose for whatever reason to sit in the minefields of life, the minefields of brokenness and hate and racism and fear, And that is sad. That is sad because there's another way forward that we could tell them about. There's a way that leads to life. There's a way that draws us towards hope. Our gospel lesson today deals with just this issue. We read how Jesus is clearing the temple courtyard of all those who are buying and selling, as as he proclaimed, I take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. This incident always shocks people because of Jesus' anger because of his passion, but really it has nothing to do with anger. I think Jesus went to that temple for one purpose, to throw out and overturn business as usual. It's just so easy to fall into the trap of business as usual that distracts and diverts and pulls us away from the path of life we're called to walk. Whenever we give that uh, I'm good and everything is fine smile, right? Have you ever given that? But behind that smile, there's emptiness, or we feel hollow, or our hearts are breaking. That's just business as usual, right? When we just, um, when we just go on autopilot, that's business as usual. When we just accept that the pain and the hurt, the injustice, that poverty and that hunger and that homelessness are just normal, and we should just accept it because it's just the way things will be and the way things are always going to be, and so just sit down and be quiet It's just the way it is. That is just business as usual. Over and over again, Jesus comes interrupting, disrupting, overturning, throwing out business as usual. Business as usual is destructive. It's destructive to our souls, to our lives, and to our very relationships. It destroys our ability to see and participate in the holy and the sacred that's already present in and among us. This is why we grow in our faith. This is why we continually reach out, why we should reach for those big visions, those those big dreams um, that are around us, that God is giving us. I think of our um, mission through one big tent. It's just one, one ministry of our church, and I think about a vision that we're putting forward to open a day center right here that will allow anyone who is homeless not to be on the street, but when they leave one of the shelters, they can come to a day center and we can give them job training and work on addictions and mental illness. It's a huge vision. It's a huge, massive, complex vision to solve a huge, massive, complex issue. But this is what Jesus calls us to do. He doesn't call us just to accept what is as business as usual. He calls us to overturn those tables. The Ten Commandments call us to do this as they call us to love God with all the heart and mind and soul. That's the first four. 
And then it calls us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. That's the last six. Do you see how Jesus defines the commandments? We need these commandments, not just as rules, but as a pathway out of the business as usual as we passionately, radically live in relationship and companionship with God, living together, living out the scripture that says we are to do justice, we are to love kindness, and we are to walk humbly with our God. These give us a way of living that moves us closer and closer to how we authentically love God and our neighbor. That's what overturns the tables. That's what wakes us up from being satisfied with business as usual. At the end of our gospel lesson, Jesus talks about how he destroyed the biggest business as usual, and that is death itself. And he said that he was talking about the temple, and the temple isn't bricks and mortar, but the temple was him. And he was saying, as you follow me, as you let me live in me and live through your heart, I will destroy the biggest business as usual that you are not to accept, and that is death, because I'm offering you life. I'm offering you abundant life. I'm offering you eternal life, and all you need to do is accept it. And so what a joy that we've been given this gift, these guiding promises that show us how to live and how to love together. Let us see these commandments not as lifeless words in stone, but as living words written on our hearts as we live them out, as we strive to live them out every day in everything that we do, in everything that we say, with every breath that we take, and every day we are blessed to be on this planet. Let us take those steps to follow, to serve, to love with all our heart and with all our strength as we take that time to be holy. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn of response, Take Time to Be Holy, hymn number 395. And I want to welcome Luke, who's going to be playing the trumpet along with Ryan as we sing this hymn together. Let's join in song, Take Time to Be Holy. So let us come as we are surrounded by these promises to live and love together as we be a people of prayer. And so if you are uh, joining us online, I invite you to use your 
uh, comment section to put in any prayers, any joys, any concerns that you may have this day. And then I will share some that we've been persistently praying for and let you all who are here in person offer up any joys or concerns that, uh, that you may have. So let me offer up these, these prayers uh, from this morning and that we've been praying for. Um, so Kristen, who works in our office, shared a, a joy that she had her first dental consultation, has another on March 6th, um, has some anxiety about the cost of surgery, but please continue to pray for guidance for her. Continued prayers for Joe Carlson, um, who um, is recovering um, from her surgery. She's at a rehab center up in Weston, and so just continued prayers of healing and strength. I saw her, and she's doing well. She was walking with, uh, with some help but she feels good. She feels really good. Please uh, continue. We lift up prayers for RV, who's here right in the front, and let us continue to pray for RV. Um, it is so good to see you, RV. You're such a sparkle and a light to be here in our congregation. Um, we, um, I would like you to pray for Bruce Miller. Um, Bruce is leaving to go to Milwaukee at the end of this week. He's having surgery, uh, pretty big surgery, and so just pray for Bruce. Um, he would really appreciate it if you just pause on Friday. It doesn't matter when, just pause on Friday and lift him up in prayer. He would really appreciate that. Um, also, um, for the family of Marianne Heck, uh, Marianne um, was a long, long-time member of our church. She moved to be closer to her daughter. Marianne passed away on November 21st of last year, and her family is uh, decided to wait to hold her service. And so we are going to be holding it this Saturday, March 9th. So this Saturday, March 9th at 11 a.m. will be the celebration of life for Marianne Heck. No visitation. We'll have the service at 11, and then we'll have a lunch in our fellowship hall afterwards. So I want to invite you to come. Marianne was involved in lots of ministries. She was one of our big members in our quilting ministry. She made a lot of the quilts uh, that went out that touched people. And so that was just one example of many things she did here. So um, I want to invite you to, first of all, be here, if you can, to support the family for Marianne Heck, um, and just keep her family in your, your prayers. All right, and then uh, continued prayers, our persistent prayers of peace for our world, uh, for all those living in areas of violence, for Ukraine, for Israel and Palestine, for the Congo, for all the areas of violence that are around us. Um, we lift them in prayer. Um, a prayer from uh, John Wiltsey. Our son Rob passed away this week. Please pray especially for his son Ethan, who's age 20. So this is from John and Melanie. So I want to invite you to keep John and Melanie in your prayers as they mourn the loss of their son and, of course, are understandably worried about their other family members. So our prayers of comfort, our prayers of peace um, go out to them in this time. All right. I don't see any other online, but how about for those of you that are here in person? Joys or concerns? And as he's walking to Audra, I just want to remind us that we are holding communion today. So for those online, we'll be doing that a little later in the service. I invite you to get your bread and juice. And if you're here in the sanctuary, hopefully you got it as well. And so, Audra. I just wanted to offer um, a joy for Luis. He is in track, and he actually is working hard to raise some fundraising um, for him to be in, involved with track. So he has some cards if you feel like going back and just some discount cards, go back and support him as he um, gets involved with school and all that's going on for him. And also if we can pray for people who are struggling, um, mental health, physical health, it's such a tough time of year and for all the caregivers involved too, that would be fabulous. All right, so a joy to support Luis, who's in track back there, and a prayer for all those with mental illness and other issues. I yeah. have three this morning. Uh, one is for uh, a dear friend of uh, mine uh, that lives in Missouri. He's going to have open-heart surgery on the 8th, and also for um, my sister-in-law, who is in Florida right now, and she's going to have... A heart surgery also to replace a valve. Um, also, uh, I, w I have a joy. I'm very thankful that my sister, Olive, came through okay with her uh, foot surgery. 
and with her infection. And uh, I went down last Sunday with my daughter to help her move from her apartment to the rehab center, living center. And there she will be staying. That's I true. thank Joy for all these uh, blessings to her that everything went okay. Thank you. All right. We pray for those that have those medical needs and a joy for your sister that all went well. I'd like to ask for prayers for Doug Femmel. Doug and Carol were on their way home from Florida, and uh, Doug became ill with infection and pneumonia, and they're in Mattoon, Illinois right now in a hospital. Not quite sure how he's doing this morning, but uh, prayers for Doug. Prayers for Doug for healing and strength in this time. I would like prayers for my friend's husband, Ron, who has had a stroke and is struggling. All right. Prayers for Ron as he recovers from a stroke. The joy for today, um, I just wanted to thank the church for allowing Girl Scouts to um, use the parking lot on Thursday to distribute all of the Girl Scout cookies. Um, <laughs> we successfully sorted and distributed 3,835 cases of cookies times 12 boxes. You can do the math. I can't. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if anyone's still looking for cookies um, and you don't have a cookie dealer, you know, send them my way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great joy for the to, cookies. <laughs> I wanted to thank uh, this congregation and friends for all their donations to the Crisis Center. We asked for love to be shown in February, and we did it great. We had four meals from Mary Martha's Circle, which I thank the ladies for. And every time we went, we had a carload of donations from all of you. So they were very, very grateful for the love shown, and we need to do it again. All right. Thank you all for that. I could say with the cookies, what a shock. I came around the corner to go home, and the whole parking lot was filled with cookies. It was like a dream. <laughs> cookies as I can see. None for me. Not a one for me. And so. you took them all home, right? No. <laughs> Not a one. I didn't take one, but. <laughs> Continued prayers for my dad as he um, gets through his rehab for after having a stroke and needs to move to a new facility. Thank you. All right. We lift them in prayer. Uh, just to add a little bit to what Tim had mentioned earlier about our refugees, we had a new family arrive about a week ago, and they are just delightful. Uh, they have a little 20-month-old boy who could uh, use some diapers um, and uh, size 3. Just throwing that out there. And um, <laughs> we have another uh, family coming. Actually, they're going to go to Rapids tomorrow, but then we have another family coming here the following week. So we really do need things. Um, what you need to understand is we, you set up houses for these people, and there's nothing in the house when you start. So we try to get them as much as we can um, at no cost or little cost. And so it's just amazing the things that we take for granted that you need to set up a new house. So take a look at that list. If there's anything that you have at your house that you could share from that list, we would greatly appreciate it. Just bring it over to church. We'll get it sorted. And uh, we welcome these new families. This new one that's coming uh, in, a couple, in a week or so is coming from Burma. So that should be really interesting. So, uh, so prayers for all our families that arrive from other shores. And take a look at that list. See if there's stuff that maybe you have in your house you could share. And so bring that by. And I know you will, because you're a very generous, loving church. We just lifted up a joy for the crisis center and the way you did that. Other prayers? Other joys? Concerns? I don't see any others online. Well, let us come with all these prayers you've named and those in our hearts. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come today as a people of prayer, as a people of your promise, as a people who know they are never forgotten, for you always have your eye on us. We come today claimed by the promise of your commandments as we resolve to follow the path they lay out to love and live together in our world with you, with each other, in peace and in hope. Renew our faith this day, we pray. Revive our joy. Restore our commitment to loving you and our neighbors. Oh God, we want to thank you for our many blessings. It could be celebrations that are going on, birthdays or anniversaries or times just to gather with family and friends. We are so thankful for that. 
We are so thankful, O oh God, for our church family, for the generosity and the warmth and the prayers uh, that come from our church family that, we, that surrounds us. We give thanks for this beautiful world and what a great gift it is. And, and we give thanks for Jesus Christ who comes to offer us this path, this path forward to overturn those tables, to end the biggest business of usual, who offers us this path towards life, towards abundant, eternal life. And for that, we are so thankful. But as we come this day, we want to pray for those who are struggling. And so we want to pray for those who are struggling with, with medical conditions. Um, those that have had surgery or those who are ill, we want to pray for healing for them. We want to pray for those who are facing surgery this week. Pray for wisdom and skill for the doctors and nurses and all those who are work with them. Let your healing presence surround them. We want to lift up in prayer this morning any who are grieving uh, losses, whether it was recent, long ago. For those who are feeling that loss, that emptiness, we pray that it will be filled with your comfort, with your hope, with your peace. Oh Lord, we pray for all those who are struggling, for the hungry, for the lonely, for those that are struggling in poverty, in homelessness, with mental illness, with addiction, whatever it may be, whatever that struggle is, oh God, we want to pray for them. Open our eyes and hands that we see them, oh God, as you call us this day through our commandments to, to, know, to love you and to extend that love outward into our community um, and beyond. Oh, Lord, we pray for peace as we list our persistent prayer for peace, and we pray for those people who've heard your call to be an ambassador of peace. We pray for them as we pray for peace in our communities, in our world. Oh, gracious God, give us the strength, we pray, to follow you, the courage to share your transforming love. Oh, God, send us out into this world. Inspire us to greater compassion. Use us to bring comfort to those around us. So we lift all these prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus, the Word made flesh, who comes to be one with us, one of us, who walks with us through all the times of life and calls us by name. As we travel with him to the cross and beyond, we offer all these prayers in hope and in faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so as a blessed people, we gather to respond to those blessings by giving back to God. So I invite you, if you didn't place your morning offering, put it in the plate as you leave the sanctuary or mail it into the church or use our website, stevenspointumc.org, and the donate button. But for all the ways you've generously given, I give thanks. And so I invite us to surround this time in prayer as we reflect on our blessings and give back. O oh God of abundance, there are no limits to the gifts you give us, no limits to your blessings, to your love. We give thanks for this opportunity we're given to make a difference as we share our time, our talents, our treasures to support our ministries that touch this world, that bring about your kingdom. Help these gifts to expand your grace and your hope throughout our world. Bless our giving and our sharing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And so as we reflect on these promises of how to live and love together, what a joy that we're given a, a means that strengthens us, that gives us that way forward as we celebrate this sacrament of communion. So I want to invite you, if you're watching online, to get some bread and juice. Have that handy in the sanctuary. I invite you to get your bread and juice. Just hold it. Don't take it yet. But I, I want to invite us to have a heart of prayer as we come to bless our elements this day. So ever-living God, you have created us from the dust of the earth and breathed into us the very breath of life. You have called your prophets and your champions from among the lowly. You have formed your people through your commandments, through your covenants and your promises to always be with them, even in the wanderings in the desert and exile in foreign lands. And you continue to be with us, promising to walk with us, claiming our hearts and our lives. In your thirst to be known to us, you have entered into our struggles coming amongst us in the inhuman person as Jesus Christ. Born in want, raised in obscurity, with us he embraces hunger and thirst, temptation, rejection, grief, suffering, and death, overturning them all. As we gather around the table, we remember how Jesus took the bread, how he blessed it and broke it, giving it to them, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body given for you, that you may be my body my hands, my heart, my feet for the world. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, 
drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me as a people of forgiveness and a people of mercy and a people of endless grace. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and cup, that in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup we may know the presence of the living Christ, that we may be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood. We give thanks for your promises of grace and hope and love that continue to claim us in this season. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, we come now to be nourished, led once again by the Spirit, as we join in that prayer that shapes us and forms us as we pray together as the body of Christ, wherever we are for worship, I invite us to pray with one heart and one voice. Pray with me, please. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so I invite you to take your bread as we take it out and we hold it. The body of Christ given for us all. And I invite you to take your cup the blood of Christ shed for us all. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for this table where all are welcomed, all are received, none are turned away. Thank you for this table of grace, this table of life, life abundant. Thank you for this time to come to hear again your promises of grace and hope that surround us. These promises that, that help us to love you with all our heart and mind and soul that open our eyes and hands that we may love our neighbors and our world and our community and beyond. Oh Lord, thank you. May we be nourished through this time. May we recommit ourselves and our lives to you in this time as we resolve this day to continue to walk in your footsteps, to continue to follow you in your path. Let us continue on this journey that we are on in this season and beyond this journey that takes us right to the cross and beyond, that allows us to overturn those tables, that business as usual that keeps us from responding, but allows us to dream big, to risk as far as we can dream, uh, continues to allow us to let our faith be lived out in powerful, life-giving ways. So let us follow you in this path of life, of love, of hope, of grace, and of peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us join in our closing hymn this morning, hymn number 634. Now let us from this table rise. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn.
So let us go forward claimed and shaped and guided by the promises, the love, the grace of God, and may the peace that passes all understanding be with us today and every day as we go forward to be those examples of peace and grace and love to all that we meet. Amen. As we close our service with our postlude. Mm-hmm.